Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship. My name is Allison Schmid, and I am the pastor here at Lansing United. And I would like to welcome you to this time of worship, especially if it's your first time. Thank you for giving it a try. Thank you for coming. A couple of hints for tuning in. One of them is that there is a comment section. And I encourage you to say hello there. Um, let other folks know that you are a part of this worshiping community. Um, we are a dispersed community, but just because we're not physically together doesn't mean that we're not emotionally and spiritually together. And communicating with each other helps us know that we are all in this together. We are physically distanced, but not spiritually or socially distanced. Our summertime worship is more casual than our traditional worship. And um, I want to invite you to a conversation on the porch today. We're going to be talking about weeds and wheat, things that grow that we like and things that grow that we don't like so much. And um, I'm going to be talking about who it is that God is calling us to be in this time and this season. We'll be looking at some of the words of Jesus in the gospel according to Matthew and talking about having ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand. The blessing of all of that is in the midst of it. There is grace that can change us, can change our circumstances, can change the way we see the whole world. And so in the light of that grace, I invite you to join with me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we know that you are already present in this place and in our lives. Help us to be present in this time of worship, even as you are already fully present. Amen. There's a beautiful hymn called, There's a Spirit of Love in This Place. It's by Mark Miller, and it's a hymn in three stanzas. The first two describe a physical place, a place of, we'd say, bricks and mortar, a place of peace in a room. But then it also talks in the third stanza about a place of peace, a place in our hearts. And I would invite you, as we sing this song together, to make it your prayer this morning, that we are in a place where God is, and God is within us, in our hearts. Let us sing together. There's a spirit of love in this place. There's a spirit of love in this place. There's a spirit of love in this place. You can see it, but it's there, just as precious as the air. There's a spirit of love in this place. Oh, hallelujah, sing Oh, uh-huh. 
There is a spirit of love in this place. We gather to worship that spirit of love. We gather to be challenged and strengthened and filled because we need that spirit. There are also places in our lives as a community where we need that spirit, that spirit of love to strengthen and teach and challenge and fill us. One of the places that we need to hear this in our life together is around systemic racism in our United States and in our United Methodist Church. Systemic means it is built into the system. Please know that I'm not talking about individuals who are still in a place of racist jokes or epithets. This is more about the kinds of things that are a part of the way that the world works. Systemic means it's woven into the fabric of our society. It's seldom our conscious actions. In fact, it's almost always unconscious actions. In the town of Lansing, where I live, we're a pretty white community. So one might think there's no racism here. But racism is a problem even in an all-white society. Wherever we allow the historical effects of racism to go unrecognized or unchallenged, as a white person, I am missing out. I have a responsibility to learn about the systemic racism. And as a Christian, it's my promise to God, my baptismal vows, in fact, to accept the freedom and the power that God gives me to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever form they present themselves. As white people, talking to other white people, we have a unique opportunity to educate each other about racial bias that's inherent in our society. We have a unique opportunity to be able to discuss with one another in ways that um, can be very frank, very down to earth as to what is it that's a part of our society that we don't even notice that comes across as racist. As white Christians living in the web of our American society's historical racist structure, we are called to claim and to live the gospel truth that God continually calls us and all people into new life. My purpose in bringing up this topic of systemic racism is not to make you feel bad, not to bring on a sense of guilt. It's certainly not to depress you. It's to say that we have an opportunity. We have a responsibility. We have a privilege to be able to confront the world that we were handed with the grace of God and to be a part of changing it, to be more like the kingdom of God, the place where God's love reigns. Grace is that power of God working within you and within me. It's a power that works together with our own free will and it can change us from the inside out. Believing that we can be changed and that it takes a lot of prayer and concerted effort, our United Methodist Church has been publishing prayers for anti-racism. That would be prayers to help us grow in our understanding of the systemic nature of racism in our culture prayers to help us grow an anti-racist viewpoint. And I invite you to join me in one of those prayers this morning. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Spirit of God, we have heard your call to share in the building up of the kingdom of heaven. Fill us with the desire to change ourselves and to change the world and flame our passion for justice into a commitment 
to address unjust situations and structures. Deepen our commitment for our sisters and brothers in America and overseas who endure the burdens of poverty, war, exploitation, and persecution. Let us enthusiastically play our part in the mission of the church in the modern world. Banish any complacency in our hearts and minds. Teach us to recognize the lack of justice. May we always act in the spirit of justice. May we envisage and pray about and create a different sort of world, a world in which injustice is replaced with a new sense of solidarity, a sense of care for one another. Enlivened by the Spirit, may we go forth in the peace of the Holy Spirit to love and serve the Lord. Amen. where children belong welcomed as part of the worshiping from water god's word bread and cup prayer and song this is where children belong surprise sometimes you think you have a plan and god changes it on you these are queen anne's lace over here, I have some beautiful flowers, except some people might call them weeds. They grew outside, not in places where they were planted on purpose, but in places where they grew up. I think they're beautiful. I think this Queen Anne's lace is beautiful, even though I picked it from growing in the middle of my lawn this morning. Yesterday, I went to visit a friend of mine, Judy Hinderleiter, and she had a vase with some Queen Anne's lace right on the table. She said, you know, some people call it a weed, and it does uh, leave little pieces of itself all over, but I just love them. They're so beautiful. I want to share with you a conversation that Judy and I had. And it was kind of a surprising one. And so it begins with Judy saying, this is a surprising day. So I have been participating in a wonderful book group um, on the book Universal Christ with a variety of folks from our church. And it has been a growing experience. I have learned so much from others and I've learned more about my faith and it has strengthened it and changed it and it has just been a growing experience. And as I read chapter 16, I was reminded of an anthem that the choir sang sometime this past year and it's called Every Breath and it's written by Jim Evans. And the words in that anthem have always spoken to me. I love them. And so I emailed them to everybody in the group because I thought they might appreciate them too. And when I emailed them to you, in two seconds flat, I got a response. Which is not always the way I am with email. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some of the lyrics. Every breath. Lord, you even knew me before I was a new me. Each day you increase me as I pray without ceasing. Every breath is a prayer for you. Every breath I am there for you. My Lord in your holy temple in my soul. Your eyes are my eyes and your hands are my hands. And I walk the world for you. You see what I see and cry for your sheep, and I do all that I can do. With you in my heart, I reach out in love 
to give all I know how to give. I try and I fail to be more like you, and you still give me life anew. Every breath is a prayer for you. Every breath I am there for you. My Lord in your holy temple, in my soul. So Judy, part of the reason that I responded so quickly to your email was because the words that you sent, the words to that song, sounded so much like the psalm that I was reading at that very moment. Would you read some of those words from Psalm 139? I'd be glad to. I'm reading Psalm 139 from the Common English Bible. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't fathom it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping only to rest on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me. Even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine bright as day because darkness is the same as light to you. And verses 23 and 24. Examine me, God. Look at my heart. Put me to the test. Know my anxious thoughts. Look to see if there are any idolatrous ways in me. Then lead me on the eternal path. Amen. Hi, my name is Crystal Cole, and I am the Youth Ministries Coordinator at LUMC. And today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who planted good seed in his field. While people were sleeping, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and went away. When the stalk sprouted and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. The servants of the landowner came and said to him, Master, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Then how is it that it has weeds? An enemy has done this, he answered. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But the landowner said, No, because if you gather the weeds, you'll pull up the wheat along with them. Let both grow side by side until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll say to the harvesters, First gather the weeds and tie them together in bundles to be burned, but bring the wheat into my barn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Judy, for sharing Psalm 139. And thank you, Crystal, for sharing from Matthew 13, another one of Jesus' parables. Will you join me once again in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And now, dear God, either through me or in spite of me, speak the word that your people listening today need to hear. Amen. So Jesus is once again saying, those who have ears, let them hear. One of the things that uh, the scholar N.T. Wright says is that when Jesus says, those who have ears to hear should understand, he's saying something like, think about that, chew on it for a while. See how that sits with the rest of what you think and know and believe. 
July is the season when Methodist ministers move around. In fact, July 1st is like fruit basket upset when uh, there are a bunch of new ministers in, new, in parsonages that are new to them. And sometimes the transition is easier than others. For a pastor that I know, one of the parts of the transition that was interesting was figuring out about the lawn. The lawn, he thought, was to be uh, mowed by the trustees. Uh, The lawn was getting a little long, his wife thought, and uh, she kept asking him about it, and he kept saying, no, no, the trustees will take care of it. The trustees will take care of it. And finally, just in this last week, the lawn was mowed, and it was wonderful. And his spouse rejoiced, and his children bawled. You see, they had seen this lawn covered in beautiful yellow dandelions as being a field of flowers. And some person they didn't know came in on a small tractor and cut them all down. Their new house was not nearly as cheery without all of the dandelions in the lawn. Sometimes what some person sees as a weed, another person sees as a flower. In our parable today, Jesus is talking about weeds and wheat. And I love at the very beginning, it says, he put before them another parable. Matthew has gathered together all of these parables into the middle of the gospel according to Matthew. There's kind of this collection of stories that's all there. So when you're ready to have some parables to chew on, you know where to find them, right in the middle of the gospel according to Matthew. Parables in the rabbinical tradition were sort of like riddles, sort of like a story that would get you to think, that would get you to think about things in a different way. They used common elements, things you were already familiar with, to hopefully help you think in an unfamiliar way. So Jesus put before them this parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. And you might think, hmm, she read that last week. We heard about seeds being spread on good soil and on rocky soil and where thorny plants came up and choked the seeds and where the soil was very shallow and the seeds came up and then quickly died because they didn't have a deep root. And then how some of the seeds even in the midst of all those conditions, some of the seeds grew and produced a hundredfold, and some produced sixtyfold, and some thirty. Those who have ears should hear. This week's story is different. Those seeds you see were all good things, but in this story, something else happened. While everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. Now, I love that part of the story because it speaks to something that I think, well, I know I have and I think that other human beings do too. It's this urge to put blame somewhere outside ourselves. An enemy did it. There's a children's song that talks about crayon on the wall, and the parent has the children lined up asking who did it, and suddenly the young one gets a look on their face and says, maybe a robber did it. Maybe not. Maybe it was one of the children in their own house who forgot the rules and put the crayon on the wall. Maybe it was an enemy who sowed weeds among the field. If you search online, there are some really fun uh, paintings of the enemy, one from the 1500s where the enemy has a, a very ugly face and three horns and feet like a chicken and a tail, sort of like a rooster. Maybe it was a evil bird that sowed some of the weeds in that field. In the time that Jesus was talking, to the people to whom he was speaking, they might have known about weeds that would come up among the wheat. 
They might even have known about enemies who might sow weeds among your wheat. There was a particular kind of weed called a darnel or a poison darnel. And as a young plant, the seedlings of darnel and the seedlings of wheat are so similar that it's very difficult to tell which is which. To pull them up, one would invariably miss some of the poisonous darnel and pull up some of the wheat. As it grows together, however, the darnel is an invasive species and its roots would wind all around the roots of the wheat. It would become almost impossible to pull up the wheat without also pulling up the weeds. There are stories about this darnel being an intoxicating kind of uh, weed if used in small doses and lethal in large doses. It doesn't really have a life of its own. It counts on being harvested and replanted the next year together with the wheat. It's almost impossible to sort out the darnel from the wheat. And so the landowner says to the servants, no, don't go in and pull it up. That's not your job. Now is not the time to do that. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes 3, where it tells us there is a time for everything, a time to plant and a time to pull up. Now is not the time to pull up. For in gathering the weeds, you would also uproot the wheat. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. There is more to this parable that comes on in a few verses. If we just continue on from there, you get three more parables. We talk about seeds and we talk about the growing of the reign of God, the growing of a kingdom. And it grows from small things, from things like a seed, a mustard seed, a wheat seed, a seed scattered on good soil or perhaps on rocky soil. It grows like yeast makes bread grow. It grows from small things like a pearl might grow from a small grain of sand. The kingdom is being planted in so many ways and in so many places. I wonder if the kingdom is growing among us, if we are able to see it, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. I wonder if the same God who could turn water into wine could turn weeds into wheat. Let those who have ears hear. Amen. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? One of the joys that we have is to share our joys and concerns, the things that we see as beautiful flowers in our lives and the things that feel like the weeds that we're working our way through right now. As we share joys, I want to congratulate Bob and Janet Keefe on their 33rd wedding anniversary today. And I want to congratulate Andrew and Laura Boyd on the birth of their first child, Eleanor Grace, and they're calling her Ellie. 
There are several um, prayer concerns that have been shared through email this week, and I would encourage you, if you wish to share them through email, um, you can share them to office at lansingunited.org, or if they're private, you can send them to me personally at pastor at lansingunited.org. You're also invited to put joys and concerns in the comment section. It's another way of us being community together. Even though we are physically distanced, we can be spiritually together in prayer. Hear, O oh God, these concerns. We pray for Deborah Barnard, for Sarah Myers, for Beth Wilcox's brother and sister, for Gail Ryan, for Brian, for all who are recovering from surgery, we pray for healing. For all who are anticipating surgery, we pray for peace and an absence of fear. For healthcare workers and for our first responders, we pray for safety. And for all who grieve, Lord, we pray for your comfort and for the assurance that our loved ones are also held forever in your eternal love. Faithful God, gardening God, you care for us with compassion and firmness, urging us to grow in our love for you, urging us to be co-workers with you in the building of your reign here on earth. Through Christ, may we hear more deeply your call to be rooted and grounded in your way and to build together with you a community that becomes the reign of Christ. We bring before you this morning these names and the concerns on our hearts, those which we don't even know how yet to put into words. We bring before you our relationships, places where we are in need of healing, in our families, in our community, in our country and in our world. Use us, O oh God, to create a world that reflects your love to all people. We pray together as Jesus taught his first disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Another way that we worship is through our gifts. We give thanks and worship for all that we have received. And the way that we live our life is a way that we say thank you to God for all of the gifts the gift of life itself. We have the opportunity as a part of our worship to give to the work of this church, that it might continue to be a place where people come to be challenged and taught and stretched and encouraged, a place where people come to grow in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. 
this morning's offerings of our gifts and our tithes and our talents will now be received. to Jim Evans for leading us in Guide My Feet, and also for sharing with us the song that inspired Judy Hinderleiter to send out the lyrics to the Universal Christ book group. Thank you to Judy for sharing with me how that story had spoken to her this week. And thank you to the Tracy family for their willingness to spread out the blanket and be a family together worshiping on the grass. Thank you to Jordan for lighting candles for us this week. And thank you, as always, to Bob Keefe and Bob Forties, and this morning to Elena and to Marsha Lynch. Um, I'm grateful for all of you who help make this service happen each week. We will be back again next week, but if you want to talk before that, um, there will be a virtual coffee hour immediately following this service on Zoom. And the uh, link was in your weekly email this week. If you're not receiving a weekly email and you'd like to be, please contact office at lansingunited.org. And if perchance you're watching this on a DVD or you know someone who doesn't have internet but would like to watch this on a DVD, um, you can call the office and um, they will help get you set up with that information. The office phone number is area code 607-533-4070. I am grateful to have spent this time together with you in worship, and I hope that you will return next week. In the time in between then, I pray that you have eyes to see and ears to hear the places around you where God is calling you to discern between wheat and weeds in your own life or perhaps in our societal life together. 
places where things that have grown up so close together that they look the same, but perhaps one is choking out the other. Help us to find a way, Lord, to be the kind of gardeners that you call us to be, to know when the time is to plant and when the time is to pull up what is planted. Thank you, Lord, for planting kingdom seeds all around us in the smallest of things, in seeds, in grains of sand, in pearls, even in people. Help us to be the people that you are calling us to be. Go now in peace in the name of the one Jesus called Abba, Father, in the name of the one who called Jesus and who calls you, my beloved child, go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.